3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We would like for you to follow along with us as we study God's word verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that we're able to see a work. We're able to see changed lives, Lord. And Lord, as we have surrendered our lives to you, Lord, we need to continue to grow in our faith. And the only way we can do that is by the study of your word. And so, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would be with us. We ask your Holy Spirit who inspired Paul to put pen to Pyrus, to write this epistle to the Thessalonian believers, uh, to be our teacher. Uh, because this, this book, and the words in the, these pages apply to us today. So Lord, may you open up our eyes that we may see ears to hear, our minds to understand, heart to receive your word. In your name we pray. Amen, amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, chapter 3. Paul writes, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to tradition which he has received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we may not be a burden to any of you, not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we command you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you who in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. In our last study, we looked at chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, in uh, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. After he set the record straight and cleared up any confusion or rumors concerning the rapture of the church or the great tribulation. And he encourages them that, no, you did not miss the rapture of the church. And no, you're not going through the great tribulation. A few things need to take place first. The falling away. And we study that the falling away is really a departure. It's referring to the rapture of the church. Um, and so the, the rapture of the church must take place first. Then the Antichrist can come. And once the Antichrist is in the picture, guess what? Then the great tribulation would take place. But those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we will be raptured. We will not go through the great tribulation. And so he is encouraging them. Also, we looked in verse 13 when Paul said, God from the beginning chose you for salvation. God from the beginning chose you for salvation. And we looked at the, um, the doctrine of election. And we saw that, hey, there is the sovereignty of God. And then you also have, with the sovereignty of God, God's 
I mean, man's free will. We have been created as free moral agents. We have a free will to choose or deny Christ. But then you have God's sovereign will, right? So, but we look in Scripture and we found that the two work, uh, or work side by side together. Yes, this is the sovereignty of God. Yes, he has given man free will. And some people may say, well, am I chosen? Well, that all depends. Have you used your free will to choose Christ? So the answer is choose to be chosen. Okay, choose to be chosen. Okay, it is God's foreknowledge. The book of life is already written. God knows who's in the book of life. It's in heaven. He controls who's written and who's not written. He knows the end from the beginning. So he knows who's going to make it through. And that all depends on you, whether you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. And then in verse 15, he tells them, he said, Therefore, brethren... Stand fast, stand fast, and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or pestle. And this is why it's important for us to study God's word. Not what people tell us, not by tradition, not by whatever denomination you are a part of. Follow the word of God and see what God has to say concerning anything, the end times or concerning your walk in, in faith. Now, we, that brings us to chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, and Paul closes his letter to the believers there in Thessalonica. Now, in light of the rapture, and this applies for you and I, in light of the rapture has not taken place yet. The church is still here, right? In light of the rapture, in light of the judgment of Christ, the great tribulation, Paul instructs the Thessalonians, and he instructs you and I, and how we are to conduct ourselves in anticipation of his coming. And so, in verses 1 through 5, Paul will call us to prayer. That's in verses 1 through 5. In verses 6 through 15, Paul gives an exhortation on proper Christian living. That's in verses 6 through 15. And then the rest of the letter, in verses 16 to 18, Paul gives us his final greetings, okay? And so we read our text. Now let us study our text verse by verse. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 1. Paul writes, Finally, brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. And this is the Apostle Paul. We're talking about one of the greatest apostles who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He is asking for prayer. And, and that really puts things in perspective. We all need prayer. All of us. But one thing for sure, when you're a leader or a pastor, and as we pray for Debbie and, and Pat, when them, not that they're pastors, but they oversee a ministry, the enemy is going to attack. We need prayer. I know for me, we, I need prayer. I constantly need prayer. There's a spiritual stronghold, a warfare that's taking place. And the enemy knows, as with any opposition, they want to eliminate the leader. And you look at history of war. If you want to be successful in any war, you want to defeat an army, you have to go and first go for the leader. You know, because we have a big bullseye on our shirts or on our backs. And the enemy knows that if he could attack Pastor A, Guess what would happen to Calvary Chapel of Milford? Many of you have been in the body of Christ. You've seen many great men, pastors, and leaders who have fallen. And what they have left, they're left with a lot of sheep who have scattered. You remember before Jesus was arrested and he was crucified, he says to his disciples, and is actually fulfilling one of the prophecies spoken of by Zechariah. Jesus said in, in Matthew 26, verse 31, it says, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, he's quoting Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock would scatter. And you know the Gospels. After Jesus was arrested and crucified, the disciples, what they do? They scattered. And that's what happens. As a pastor, you, we need prayer. I don't, want this to, I don't want this to be about me. But sticking to what Paul, looking at a man like Paul, Paul is a man of prayer. He's a man of prayer. You look at all his epistles, and the word prayer is, ma is mentioned so many times. But he himself is asking for prayer. And I know I speak for my wife and I that we covered, we covered and appreciate your prayers. So please continue to pray for myself and any other pastor that you know, uh, that, at least for me, that I may, you know, I may be obedient, faithful, and stay the course of Christ. The one thing I do ask when, to pray for me, especially in the area of me dying. 
You've heard me before this, right? If I am dying on my deathbed, don't pray for God to <laughs> resurrect me. Don't pray for God to keep me alive. Because if I'm on my deathbed, and as Chuck Smith was saying, and I am almost there, I see Jesus. I see the heavens, and I'm running to Jesus, and poof, I'm going to see you. <laughs> I'm going to be upset. <laughs> I am not afraid to die. I am not afraid to die. A Christian shouldn't be afraid to die because we're ready to die. And those who are not. And so just pray for God's will. Pray for God's will. Now, Paul prayer requests, one thing is not selfish. We're going to see. It's not a selfish prayer request. It's not about me, myself, and I. And Paul is not going to pray for his needs or wants, but his prayer request has to do with God and his word to effectively move throughout his ministry. And so let's look. He's going to pray for three areas, three areas. Let's look at verse 1 again. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us. Number one, that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. Swiftly. In the Greek, it means to, to speed on, with, to make progress, to move on. And that's his prayer. And saints, this is applicable for us today. We need to constantly need to pray for the gospel of Jesus Christ to move in our community, in our nation, in our cities, in our families, in our churches, with our neighbors and with our friends. We need the gospel to move swiftly and effectively. You know, this nation, as we see this world, is so divided, so lost, so confused. There are people who are depressed and suffering without hope and not realizing there is hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ. If there's ever a time to share the gospel and for it to move swiftly, it is now. It is now. And, and what this world has gone through with the COVID virus and everything else, you know, people are home. They're depressed. They're without hope. And we have hope. We have it. We need to share it. We need to share the hope of Jesus Christ more than the government is pushing vaccination. Because we know that only Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ, one can be saved. What good is saving the life if you're going to hell? We need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to redeem the time. This is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And we need to pray that the, that the gospel will come. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the great commission for all Christians. It needs to move swiftly. This is a command, by the way. Jesus said, oh, when you have time, see if you could just share the gospel and make disciples. When you have time, you know. Or maybe, not this year, okay, maybe next year. It's a command. And so the gospel and the word of God needs to move swiftly. And this is an Old Testament uh, uh, scripture as well. In Psalms 147, verse 15, it says, He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. That's his first prayer. It's not a selfish prayer. It's something that we ought to pray. His second prayer is at the end of verse 1. He says, and to be glorified just as it is with you. To be glorified. In other words, he wants the word of God to be praised, to be honored, to be exalted. That's his second prayer request, that it may be honored. The word today is not being honored. The word, as a matter of fact, in some churches are not being preached or taught. There's a lot of motivational speaking. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of entertainment. As Charles Spurgeon said, the day will come, and it already has come, when instead of, instead of the shepherd feeding the sheep, you got clowns entertaining the goats. And it's the truth. We need to honor the word of God. That it may be glorified. It, he said, it, it may be glorious just as it's with you. The, the, the Thessalonians were known to share the gospel. Was the gospel moved swiftly with the Thessalonian believers? Absolutely. Paul only spent three Sabbaths, three weeks with them in Acts chapter 17 tells us. Didn't have much to disciple them. But they were a thriving church. They were growing, even in the midst of persecution. Their faith, they were known for their faith. They were known for their love in the midst of persecution. We don't know what persecution is here in the West, in America. We don't know what that is. But they were growing. Was it working with the Thessalonians? Absolutely. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. Matter of fact, Paul acknowledges in his first letter to the Thessalonians, he says, from, it said, For from you the word of the Lord has sound forth like a blast, not only in Macedonia or Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out. Everybody knew them. So that we do not need to say anything. Hey, we were planning a trip over there, but guess what? You guys already uh, shared the gospel in that area. And so they were known for that. So he prayed, that's his second prayer. Thirdly, his third prayer is in verse two. Let's look at verse two. He says, and that we, Paul speaking of himself, he's talking about Silas and Timothy, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. So his third prayer is that the missionary team of Paul, Timothy, and Silas would be delivered, rescued from unreasonable and wicked men. Most likely, Paul is referring to those who, the angry mob in Acts chapter 17, that were following Paul, and everywhere he went, they were angry at Paul. Because Paul, whenever he traveled, if you look in the back of your Bibles, you do have maps in the back of your Bibles, not the back of your phone. You probably have Mickey Mouse or your picture of your family. But in the back of your Bibles, you have those maps, and it shows Paul's first missionary journey. The second one, he goes further. His third missionary journey, he goes third. It goes, it goes all the way around. I mean, he's all over uh, Asia Minor, Rome. But he continued. They were following him. But when Paul would travel, he always went to the synagogue first. He went to the Jews first. Not because the Jews were special, but because the Jews were waiting thousands of years for the Messiah. And he, going in with the heart and the attitude, say, listen, these guys have been waiting for the Messiah through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have found the Messiah. Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross. He rose. He fulfilled all 300 Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. I'm going to go to the synagogue and share it with the fellow Jews. Some accepted, and most of them didn't. And so they didn't hate Paul because of Paul. They hated Paul because of the gospel. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, people don't hate you because they don't like the way you comb your hair. Not because of the way you look. If you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, people are going to hate you, not because of you, because of Jesus Christ. It's not you, but the Jesus in you that they hate. And that's what happened with Paul. And so what happens is now when you speak and share the gospel, what you're going to have, either you're going to have people going to accept the gospel, or they become, as Paul says, unreasonable and wicked. You share the gospel. Many of you who do share the gospel, you know what I'm talking about. You get some people who accept the truth of the gospel and praise God that they do. But then you get people who say, oh, I don't want to listen. Just like as Debbie said earlier when she first heard the gospel. Eh. And then unreasonable, and then you get people who are wicked. And so it's because of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. You could talk about any subject anywhere. You talk about traveling, you could talk about sports, science, and depending on politics, what <laughs> geographical area you're in, but you could talk about anything, but talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unreasonable, wicked men. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it because of Jesus. Now, they might be reasonable if you say God. If you use the word God, you, you might get them. 50-50, you probably get them. But here's the difference, because there are many gods. But when you say Jesus Christ, that's when you probably find out most of the unreasonable and wicked people. Because Jesus changes everything. You say God, there's a lot of gods. What God are you talking about? Okay, God, yeah, God, God, yeah. Mother, God is this universe. God is that tree. God is the plant. You know, I had one guy say, went into the church and when we were in town, he said, God is everything. God is here. God is the floor. I said, why would I want to worship the floor? What kind of God is that? So when you mention Jesus, it changes everything because it talks about the blood. It talks about repentance. It talks about submitting your life. It changes everything. So this is what, 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 what Paul is praying for. Listen, we're going to share the gospel. We want it to move swiftly. We want it to be honored. And we want to be rescued from unreasonable people. It's one thing when people don't want to hear the gospel. It's another thing when they stop people from sharing the gospel. 
and unreasonable wicked men. So that's the prayer, and that should be our prayer when we share the gospel. Pray that the, the word of God would move swiftly, that it will be respected and honored, and that those that you're sharing the gospel with would receive it and not be unreasonable or wicked. And now he's talking about, uh, he, says, he says, for all, for not all have faith. Not all have faith. He's not talking about Christians. He's talking about unbelievers. Every single one of us who have been born again, who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and person and Savior, we have faith. And a measure of faith might be different, but here's the thing. God gives us a measure of faith. It tells us, Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul says this, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. A measure of faith. So Paul's speaking about unbelievers. He said, verse 3, he said, but the Lord is faithful. You see the contrast here. Uh, the contrast between the end of verse 2 and, and, and verse 3. In the end of verse 2, he says, not all have faith. That's 2. But the Lord is faithful. Verse 3. God is faithful. Our trust is not in man. Our trust is in the Lord. Our faith is in Christ. And we need to look away from faithless, faithless men, people, and place our faith in Jesus Christ. One thing for sure, we, we, we sang the song, Great is Your Faithfulness. I don't think we understand what it means, how great his faithfulness is. Quite often, we're thankful for the things that we see that God does for us. But we never really... Stop and think, you know, there are things that God has done for me I did not see. And I know that every time that I come to him, he's faithful. First John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. I love that. I don't have it up there, but this is for the Christian. This is what we, that verse is called the Christian bar soap. Because we're not perfect. John is writing to believers, he says, if you say you don't sin, he's talking to Christians, you make him a liar. We all, we don't practice sin. We're not sinners in the sense that we don't practice sin. We've been saved by that, but we do fail. We do fall. We do sin. But when we do, the Bible says he is faithful to forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. You know what that means? It doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how many times you're struggling with that sin. He said he is faithful. I don't know what that means to you, but that means a lot to me. I have an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ. And when, they, when Satan, who loves to bring condemnation, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. We go to that verse and we say, you know what? He's faithful. No matter, no matter. When I come to him, how often I come to him, he's faithful. He's faithful. But Pastor Eddie, you don't understand. No, listen. He's faithful. But no, get on your knees, repent. He's going to forgive you. He's faithful. He's faithful. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Verse 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. He will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Saints, listen, we're on the winning side. We're, I don't know if you read your Bible, but in the end, we win. Whether you die of natural causes or whatever, you win. Whether Christ comes from the church, you win. We win. We're on the winning side. We belong to God or Almighty, and God establishes his own, and he guards his own. God is faithful to strengthen you and to guard you from the evil one. Who is the evil one? I like in the book of Revelation, it gives all four his name. He is the old serpent. He is the dragon. He's the devil. He is Satan himself. That's the evil one. Greek definite, definite article, the, 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 is the evil one. He's not a evil one, the, speaking of Satan himself. Now with that said, now with that said, we understand where we are precisely in Christ. But with that said, understand this. As sons and daughters 
of Jesus Christ, that does not mean that we are, uh, are exempt from natural disasters. We're not exempt from sicknesses, illnesses, regardless of the, what the pro prosperity teachers tell you on the TV channel. The TV evangelist, oh, you don't need to be sick. No, if you're sick, you have a sin in your life. Really? Okay. What about you? And it make you feel like you're doing something wrong. Hey, read Job. Job lost everything. He had the three greatest counselors with him. And those of you who laugh, you know, because they weren't one great counselors. They said, what did you do, Job? What did you do? Did you tithe? Did you what? Come on. Did, did you go to church Sunday? We're not exempt from discrimination, detention, or even death. However, however, what God does promise here in his word, he would not allow Satan to go beyond a certain line that he has drawn himself with, a, with his hand. Satan has boundaries. Again, look at Job. You remember Job. Remember when the Lord said to Satan about Job, he said, have you considered my servant Job? And there is none like him on earth, and no one fears God and shuns evil. Saint said, yeah, you put the wall of protection around him. It's good to know that God still does that. You put a wall of protection around him, his family, his property, and everything he has. In Job chapter 1, verse 12, it says, all right, and you know, Satan would say, yeah, let, you take that away from him. Let's see what happens. Said, All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possess, but do not harm him physically. That's the way God works. Physically. Satan cannot take your life. Nowhere in Scripture you're going to find that. Because your life... The date of your death is in God's hands, just as the date of your birth. God controls your life. He controls when it's time for you to come home. Now, Satan may oppress you, but he cannot possess you. I've been around Christians that would tell, oh, yeah, he's a Christian. Yeah, but he's possessed by a demon. I said, that's not biblical. Because God is not into time sharing. If the Holy Spirit is in your heart, greater is he who is in me than the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world. God is not into time sharing. There's no such thing. He may, pose, he may oppress you, you know, attack you, just the way Satan did with Job, but he cannot control. Now, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, look out. You can be possessed. You can be possessed. And in my previous line of, of appointment, and let me tell you, I saw people that I knew, without a doubt, they were possessed because Christ is not in their heart. Satan can tempt you. We're all going to be tempted. He tempted Jesus, right? 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. It's not a sin to be tempted. We know that, but it's a sin to fall into temptation. But God is faithful even there. He's faithful to forgive your sins. He doesn't allow Satan to harm you. And he is faithful when you're even being tempted. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is what? Faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation would also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You can't say the devil made me do it. It's not biblical. You have the choice. Free will, Remember? Free will to accept Christ, free will to follow your temptation. But God is faithful there. Now let's move on. Verse 4, he says, And we have confidence. Confidence in who? Not in money, not in man, not in the government, not in our own strength and gifts, our abilities, our talents, our intellect. We have faith. I mean, we have confidence in who? In the Lord. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you both to do and will, and will do the things we command you. Paul's confidence was in the Lord. And he was confident in the Lord that the Lord will, will be a help, will be their strength for the Thessalonians to do and continue to do what Paul has taught them in the word of God. 
Understand, New Testament wasn't canonized at this point. Paul used the Old Testament. Can you imagine? I, I would find it hard <laughs> to share the gospel with just the Old Testament. <laughs> but that's how the birth of the church started, by the way. That's how Paul, and that's how even Peter, who gave the greatest sermon there in the book of Acts at the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 gave their lives to the Lord. But he's talking about the command, the things that he commanded him. You see, when Satan took away all that Job had, you know, after, he, you know, disaster after disaster, his family, his home, his property took everything away except his wife. Except his wife. Boils. His wife said, why don't you curse God? Job chapter 13, verse 15, Job says this, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That is having confidence in the Lord, standing fast in the midst of trials and tribulations. And you know, our confidence needs to be in the Lord, not in self. This, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to me, we all need to remember this. Our confidence needs to be in the Lord, not self. Philippians chapter three, verse three, uh, verse three Paul writes, rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. Why? Romans chapter 7, verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. That's speaking of Christian, Paul's a Christian at this time. Right? He's writing the book of Romans, right? If we think that we don't have this, then we need to check. We need to put things in priority. We need to put things in perspective. We're still not perfect, yet we're being renewed day by day because of Jesus Christ. Our confidence needs to be in the Lord, not in self. And so saints, we need to remember this, that when you accepted Jesus Christ, understand this, the moment you accept Jesus Christ, Christ enters into your heart. And that moment, the Holy Spirit begins to work. Now, we've studied this before with Thessalonians. Positionally, we're complete. Positionally, we're sanctified. Positionally, we're ready. It's already done. You're pure. Positionally, in Christ, because of who we are in Christ. Positionally, we're complete. We lack nothing because we have everything, Jesus Christ. But practically, we need to work it out. We're still being sanctified. Practically, we're still being completed unto the day of Christ. That's what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Is it being confident of this very thing that he, speaking of Jesus Christ, who has begun a good work in you? When did he begin that? When you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, person, and Savior, when you were born again. He says, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. What does that mean? That means when you stand before Jesus, when it's done. And that's going back when I was praying. I was asking you, when you pray for me, if I'm dying... When I want to see Jesus, I want to hear, well done, that I'm completed. I don't want to see people praying for me. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well done. When is it going to be completed? When you stand before Christ in glory with your glorified bodies, that's when it's done. He is faithful. Verse 5, he says, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Oh, how we need God to direct our hearts in love. One of the greatest commandments is love. Love. They asked Jesus, Jesus, of all the 613 commandments, which is the greatest? Oh, it's very simple. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Greatest commandment. He said, upon these two laws, these commandments, hang all the laws in the, of the prophets. Because if I love God, I would not break the other commandments. If I love my neighbor, I don't have to worry about stealing from him, wanting to murder him, right? Love. And we need God to direct our hearts and continually direct our hearts. Why? Jeremiah 17, 9. Here's another one. I'm not, this is not motivational speaking, okay? This is scripture, okay? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitfully is deceitfully above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Well, we need God to direct our hearts in love. In love. 
in love. You see, we are all called to love just as, as Jesus loved us. Jesus didn't say, hey, love others in your own, your own way. It's a command, by the way. It wasn't a suggestion. That's what he said in John chapter 13, verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. How much has Jesus loved you? Death on the cross. That's the love. That's a true disciple of Christ. And so when the Lord directs a heart in his love, God's love is, it, it is manifest by the power of the Spirit because only the Spirit of God, only who, the source of love, can make love real in your life where you could just pour it out to others. Question, how much does God love you? You know the answer. So too we ought to love one another. And as we love, patience kicks in. Because we love, we're patient. Love is patient. Love is kind. First Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Love hold, keeps no record. How much patience God has for you? <sighs> Unlimited. And let me tell you, God was really patient with me. Especially in my teen and pre-20 years. Very patient. That's verses 1 through 5. Paul calls us to prayer. These are the things we need to pray now. Now verses 6 through 15, Paul gives an exhortation on proper Christian living. Now, just again to give you a little bit of background of this church, um, just as with every church, the church of Thessalonians had problems. They were thriving. They were, they were growing. But there was problems. With every church, there's problems in every church. And we always say, if you find the perfect church, don't be a part of it, because it will not be perfect. And the reason why churches are not perfect is because why? People, people, wherever you have people, you have problems. Anyway, verse six, he gives a warning. He said, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is a command, not a suggestion, it's with authority Paul is speaking of, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he receives from us. The Greek word withdraw, stello, means to avoid, to shun, to pull back from. When we see someone in, acting disorderly, it could, and Paul's going to give one of those examples. We're to withdraw. This is what's called church discipline. This is not only for the pastor and leader, and this is for every believer to follow and obey. If a brother or sister in Christ is disorderly, as for the scriptures, it says we're to withdraw. That's what it says here, right? I, I'm not trying to, you know, I know people are quick to judge. Oh, really? Let me find somebody who I could withdraw from. Hey, why didn't you come to our fellowship? I'm withdrawing from you. <laughs> That's not a license to find every little excuse. You didn't invite me to your... No, forget it. I'm not... I'm with, anyway. There were those in the Thessalonian church that were disorderly. They were not following and obeying the word of God and how to behave. And Paul set the example. And they were disorderly because they had left their jobs. They were mooching off of people. Remember, they thought that Jesus Christ, the return of Jesus Christ was imminent. So they... You know, they sold everything. If you look throughout church history, you find there are certain groups of Christians that have sold everything. Oh, Jesus is coming. Here's the date. And the Bible says, no, you know, every time somebody gives me a date, I'm just saying, I'll see you tomorrow. When, is he, when do you say he's coming? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Two things could happen. Either they would be rebuked and going against the scripture, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour, Right? I would be in heaven. I say, hey, you're right. You picked it. You should play lotto. Not just kidding, don't play lotto. <laughs> but you know, the Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour. Now, whether we like it or not, discipline is good and it's healthy. All right, get some amens from your, past, your parents. Amen. We've seen that. It's good whether you're working out. Obviously, I don't work out. But if you work out, you discipline yourself. You're into sports, you discipline yourself. You find every area of life that you discipline yourself and know that you would grow. And so disciplining 
As parents, would, we discipline our children so they would, they would know the wrong from right. What this proverb says, it says, spare the rod, spoil the child. We're not talking about child abuse. We're talking about being disciplined. Sometimes kids, the younger they are, they need a little spanking. As they get older, now they know. And I tell you, kids who are not disciplined, I've seen it in the streets, 12, 13 year olds with guns. When I worked as a police officer, 12, 13 year olds with guns. Or one that stuck out the most, that always sticks out to me. Kid, I, I think he was like 14 or 15. And every time I see them in a juvenile room, I always try to find an opportunity to minister to them. They're not my responsibility. It wasn't my call or job, but I usually see someone that young. I figure I could share something. And he didn't want to talk to me at all. I was just sharing, talk, trying to talk to him. But anyway, the officer that had to pick him up, I said, what's the story with this kid? Oh, he beat up his grandfather or grandmother, I don't recall. I said, what? He said, that's nothing. He was here two months ago. He beat up his mother. Why? He wasn't disciplined. They spared the right. And sometimes parents are the worst when it comes to disciplining the children. But it's healthy. If you love someone, you, you bring discipline. And this is what this is all about, church discipline. God, even God disciplines us. Proverbs 3, chapter 3, verse 12, it says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Hebrews 12, 11, it says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful. We know that. For the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, here it is, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And in the same way, church discipline, if you really, really, really love your brother in Christ and they are disorderly at this point, in this case, it's them not working. You share with love, we share with love. If they don't follow those instructions, then you are to withdraw. We draw for them. And this is good instruction from, from the scriptures to withdraw from them because they are disorderly and, and by letting them know that their conduct is unacceptable, is not biblical, you know, it'll have them think and it'll have them repent. And hopefully they, as we withdraw from them, they will begin to feel the consequences of their actions. And at that point, they could either prove to be repentive or they will continue on. It's up to the Lord. Jesus, in similar fashion, in similar fashion, Jesus gave us this. About, he speaks about the offending brother in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. You probably know this. He said, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him. That's the first step. Don't start gossiping between you and that brother. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. Okay, you reconcile. That's fine. But that's not always, always the case. Jesus said, but if he will not hear... Take with you one or two more, two witnesses, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. People like to use that to name it and claim it, you know, blab it and grab it, shake it and bake it. They want everything. No, that's not what it is. It has to deal with this. Verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, even the, the three or two, tell it to the church. That's the third step. But here's the fourth step. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. You know, we need to encourage one another. We need to be, obey the word, and that's you and I. If we're not following this, what we're saying is, I agree with your behavior. We're being obedient. Disobedient to the word of God tells us to bring correction and at the same time withdraw from them so that they will learn the, conduct, the consequence of the action but we're being disobedient to the word, number one. Number two, you're saying you agree with them. It's okay. And you're pretty much an enabler. And that's, you know, when people talk about pastors or leaders, that's something I was taught before I became a pastor. If anybody brings the accusation against a pastor, you know, you need witnesses. That's serious stuff. But parents, they enable their words. Anyway, 
Paul, he talked the talk and he walked the walk. Look at, let's look at verses 7 and 8. It says, For you yourself know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. But we worked, we labored, we toiled, we set the example. We were ministers, we were apostles. That, was, that wasn't beneath, Paul didn't think anything was beneath him, just like me. I, sometimes people catch me cleaning here and say, no, you pastor, you have somebody else do that? And there's nothing beneath me, it needs to be done, I'll do it, it's no big deal. And he says, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but work with labor and toil not a day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Verse 9, he says, not because we do not have authority, meaning, hey, we could have said, hey, we're apostles, you're a church, go get us something to eat. They didn't do that. Paul didn't want to be a financial burden to them. And I think this is where a lot of the TBN, TV, preachers, prosperity, false prophets need to read this passage. Instead of saying, hey, I need another jet. Yeah, go work like Paul did. Verse 10, he says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. You don't work, you don't eat. When you feed them, and you keep feeding them, they're not working, you're an enabler. <laughs> you're telling what they're doing is right, don't worry, I got you. No. But the Bible says to feed them. But the Bible says also to withdraw from them and correct them. But what you do is you're enabling. And that's why I see some parents where some of their kids are on drugs or whatever, and they keep helping them. Oh, but that's my son. Oh, that's my daughter. I got to help them. You know, they're going to be on the street. Oh, my son, my daughter. Yeah, love is tough. You keep enabling them. Don't do it. You need to work in order to eat. That happened in the garden. Remember Adam and Eve? They ate of the fruit. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. The Lord said, Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herbs of the field in the sweat of your face. That's work. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. From out of it you were taken. From dust you are, and dust you shall return. This started from the very beginning. Proverbs 16, 26, it says, It is good for workers to have an appetite. An empty stomach drives them on. And so there's absolutely no reason why people shouldn't work or be idle, especially Christians. I mean, we live in a, in a, in a culture, and I, I'm from New York City, and, and a lot of people are dependent on public assistance. We're talking about fifth, sixth generations. That's what they were taught. Sense of entitlement, do nothing. And there were Christians in the city when I was ministering in the, in, in the city. And I told them the truth. That's what people can't work. You're able body. They said, but I can't see. What, you're blind? No, I just can't see myself working. <laughs> Get a job. I understand if you're disabled. And let me tell you, when I go to places like Walmart, and I see disabled people in their wheelchair, that blesses me. There's no reason. Paul takes it further. First Timothy verse... 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, he says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. <clears throat> Moving on, verses 11 and 12. But we hear that there are some of you who walk, who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through the Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Idleness breeds sin. That's what it does. They were busy being busybodies. They weren't minding their own business. They were walking around because they, weren't, they didn't have a job. They were going from home to home. It's just causing problems. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, um, Paul says this, that you also inspire to lead a quiet, a quiet life to mind your own business. You see that phrase, but it's ancient. To work with your own hands as we command you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. And verse 13 says, But as for you, he's speaking to those who are working, Christians who are you know, setting the example, but for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Continue. Work. Jesus said, blessed is he when the, when the Son of Man comes, he finds doing. Doing. That's in ministry. But that's also in everything else. Verse 14, 
Paul points this, he gives this warning again, so we can know, oh, wait a minute, that's, oh, that's, that was written 2,000 years ago. No, we, you know, we love everybody. Kumbaya. That's just, oh, no. Just, it's being disobedient. Here's what the word says. This, you don't, don't judge me. This is what the word says. Why we read it, verse by verse. Verse 14 says, if any man, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person. And do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. That's the only way he's going to grow. But verse 15, you do not count him, yet do not count him as an enemy. That's important. But admonish him as a brother. Encourage him. You know, I love what John Corson said. I love, he, in his commentary, he writes this. He said, the only people who have the right to point out the dirt on another's feet are those who have a towel around their waist and a basin of water in their hands and are willing to wash them. You want to point out sin? It's easy to point out sin because it really looks bad when somebody else does it, but when we do it, it doesn't look bad. But if you want to point out sin, hey, be really willing to, you know, not expose them. Don't, go in the, don't, don't shout, hey, listen, you know, Steve Stoner is taking all the food. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, it was your turn. <laughs> you know, don't blow him out. Say, listen, brother, it's between you and me because I love you. And, and, and just work with them. And they say, you know what? Yeah, I'm struggling with this. You, hey, I'm here for you. Let's, let's pray. Hopefully that's how it ends up. But you know, the Bible warns us because we're quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he falls. Verse 16 and 18, Paul gives his greetings now. He closes the letter. He says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. Now, verse 17 is important. The salutation of Paul with my own hands. He's writing this, which is a sign of every epistle. So I write, remember, the reason why Paul wrote 1st, 2nd Thessalonians is because there was rumors, actually 2 Thessalonians, there was rumors that he wrote that Jesus Christ already came and that they were going through the rapture. He said, as is of the letter was written by us, it was a forged letter. So he closes his letter to say, so I write, verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and God's people say, amen. amen. Now, next week, Lord willing, we're gonna study 1 Timothy. So you get a, a head start and, and uh, just study, you know, this, this book that Paul has written now to uh, Timothy. And uh, Lord willing, we will begin that next week. Don't forget, visit Debbie and Pat. Um, you could go into the, uh, the, the, the mobile unit. Visit Pat at the desk, please. At least say hello and uh, pray for them. Let us stand. I'm sorry, Pat and Debbie. Debbie, you're going to be here. And Pat, oh, yeah. he's responsible the man's responsible for the vehicle. <laughs> Just get it. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for fellowship. Lord, we had a great journey through First and Second Thessalonians. I pray that we do not forget the things we were taught. But you promised that. You said your Holy Spirit, he would come, the parakletos. He would bring to remembrance the things that I have taught you. And Lord, we need to be reminded constantly of your word that we may glorify you here and now. And Lord, now be with us as we depart. Be with us in fellowship, in love, grace, and peace. We again are grateful for the ministry of Bridge Women's Center. Bless Debbie and Pat in this ministry. We pray that the numbers of saved babies will double, if not triple. We pray for your provision for the next vehicle, and we pray for a third vehicle. Lord, there's, there's so many, I believe, 30 million babies have been aborted. I saw on their Facebook page. Lord, we pray for every single one. Be with us, Lord. We thank you for your word. And all God's people say, amen. amen. God bless you. May the Lord be with you. Have a blessed day.